Thank you very much, Alexander. That was a beautiful introduction. I told her very quietly that she made me cry a little bit. So thank you so much for that. And she's one of the many graduate students I've had the opportunity to work with over the years. And it's just been such a joy. Big thank you to Brianne Scoggin, Arthur Montiano, and all of the students involved in the Fresno State Talks project. This is the last night. You've been working super hard. Congratulations on all your success. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. It's been a great ride. Thank all of you. Also, I want to thank all of you. One thing that I've come to learn about myself is that time is one of our most precious resources, at least to me. And the fact that you rearranged schedules to be here tonight, I really appreciate that, and I want to thank you for that. I'm super excited to talk to you about sports psychology, performance psychology, a topic I'm really passionate about, and a specific application of that called the psychological uniform. Just making sure it works. <laughs> I'm wondering if you know who these people are. On the left is Missy Franklin, 200-meter backstroke, backstroke excuse me, winner at the London Olympics in 2012. To the right is Ted Ligeti. He won the men's giant slalom in Sochi just a couple of weeks ago. I'm wondering if you know who these two people are. Well, if you pay attention to these sports, you might, but I'm thinking probably you don't. On the left is Elizabeth Simmons. She finished 3.2 seconds behind Missy Franklin, and because of that, she stayed off the podium. She was fourth. To the right, if you're following my line of thinking, you probably know that this person also didn't make it to the podium. Marcel Kircher from Austria finished, are you ready for this, less than one second behind the gold medal winner. And that was enough to keep him off the podium. So athletes need to be distinguished in some way. How do they get there? And what's that all about? Jerry Seinfeld, some of you may know who he is. He is one of my favorite comedians. And he has this whole bit about athletes and performance and speed. And it goes something like this, and I hope you can pick up on it. So if this is the finish line right here. First, second, third, never heard of you. And that's basically what it boils down to. Athletes need to do a lot of things in order to get to the podium. And here's some of them. They need to get involved in sports-specific physical training. They need to participate in strength training. They need to work on proper mechanics, or we refer to it in kinesiology as biomechanics. They also have to have sports-specific tactical knowledge. Coaches talk a lot about X's and O's and what that looks like. They also need to have proper nutrition and, of course, adequate rest. All athletes have generally picked up on that these are the things that they need. But, of course, you know that I'm going to share and I'm going to argue that there's something missing. Something else contributes to athletic performance. And that thing is the mind. Tonight, I'm going to be sharing with you how we can engage our brain to get peak performance, because that's what athletes are wanting. I also want to talk to you a little bit about the uniform. And here's how this came to be. Athletes put on a uniform to train and compete. This soccer athlete is wearing cleats, shin guards, and his uniform. These hip hop dancers are wearing a costume as well. That's their uniform. Bigger skaters wear skates. Football players wear helmets and pads. All athletes put on a uniform to train and compete. They want peak performance. They want to get those gold medals, those silvers, those bronze. If they want to do that, they need the psychological uniform or sports psychology. I think of this as being a key to peak performance, a key to success. When athletes work on the mental aspect, this gives them an opportunity to distinguish themselves from others. This gives them an opportunity for distinction. The athletes in Sochi at the Olympic and Paralympics may win these medals. And I think we would all agree that they've distinguished themselves from the other athletes that they competed against in that event on that day. So maybe you're saying to yourself, you know what, that sounds great, but I'm not an athlete anymore. Well, maybe you're a coach. I chatted with some of our coaches here tonight. Thanks for coming. The psychological uniform is for you because it's going to help you get the most out of yourself and your athletes. Maybe you're not a coach. Maybe you're an official. They have a pretty stressful job, right? Half of the time, half of the people don't like what they're doing. Okay? So they need to have their psychological uniform on to do their best. Maybe you're involved in sports medicine. 
Well, if that's the case, you need sports psychology in order to give your best to the athletes under your care. Okay, maybe you still don't see yourself up here yet. Well, performance is in everything that we do. And everybody who has a performance aspect to what they do can use sports psychology to do it better. Like, for example, surgeons. We need them to be fully focused when they operate on us, right? That's what we're hoping for. Teachers. We know when teachers are fully engaged and attentive to their students, they're going to be doing their best. Sports psychology will help them. One of the things that I always hope and pray for when I take a flight is that the pilots, the people in air traffic control, and the flight attendants are fully focused and ready to go because my safety depends on it. The same is true for firefighters. They also need to be fully focused and ready to go. They need sports psychology. Entertainers, musicians, performers, they also need sports psychology so that they can give their best. Adele has been outspoken in terms of being anxious before she performs. Some other names that have that same thing going on are Carly Simon and Barbara Streisand. They get a lot of stage fright. Sports psychology can help them. Now, some of you are saying, but I'm in school right now. I'm not a surgeon yet. I want to be a firefighter, but I'm not quite there. Well, guess what? No matter where you are, no matter what your lot in life is right now, you can use sports psychology. If you're involved in relationships, if you're a student and you have to do exams or give oral presentations, this can help you. If you have a part-time job, if you deal with conflict, if you're a parent, this can help you. Because the bottom line is that sports psychology skills are life skills. And they can be applicable to every area of your life. So when I talk about athletes, I'm using them as a jumping off point for everything else that we have going on. So what is this uniform thing? Well, it's a framework. And I like to look at this as, again, a blueprint for success, a way to achieve peak performance. So what does it really look like? Here it is. It's an acronym. It represents seven sports psychology skills and concepts. Now, a couple things I want you to know about it. I didn't just pick these things out of the air. I didn't just say, oh, yeah, goal setting. Let's put that in there. The seven sports psychology skills and concepts are based on the best practices in the sports psychology literature. Additionally, you may not know it, but I've been consulting for quite a long time with athletes and other performers. So it's based on my consulting experience and my research. We've been in the high schools for several years now doing research with the uniform program. And so this framework is based on all of that together. The other thing that I want you to know about uniform is that these seven sports psychology skills and concepts are not mutually exclusive. They're not in separate boxes. I'm going to talk about them separately tonight for sake of clarity, but there's a lot of overlap, there's a lot of interplay. So please know that as we move forward. Now I've shared with you that I've done some research, and just in case you're wondering, I've presented at conferences and I have published in peer-reviewed journals. If you're interested in getting to sleep at night and you want some reading, let me know and I'm happy to share it with you, okay? Just kidding, it's really quite fascinating, at least I think so. Okay. So let's get into it. Use goal setting. We're going to start there. I like these pictures because these people are standing at a spot, at a spot excuse me, where they've got an idea, but where do you go with it from there? Antoine de Saint-Exupéry was a French aviator, and he said this quote, a goal without a plan is just a wish. And this is the idea that we have goals in mind, but oftentimes we're not sure what to do with them. Let me share you a bit of his story. At the age of 11, he took his first flight. At 26, he was a pilot, because that was the goal he decided on way back when. And he worked towards that. So we need to not just have a goal, but figure out how we're going to get there. Now, what are your goals? Maybe these resonate with you. Maybe your goal is to get an A-plus on an exam or get an A in a specific course. Maybe your goal is to get your college degree. Maybe you want to achieve some athletic accomplishment. Or maybe you have an idea in your head that you'd like to do a marathon or a half marathon just because it looks like so much fun. Or maybe 
Your goal is to get that primo job once you graduate. If you learn how to set goals when you were a child and you work towards them, guess what? When you get to college and beyond, you're going to be more successful. But there's good news. If you haven't started setting goals yet, it's not too late. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So how do we come up with a plan? What do we do when we have this goal in mind? Well, there's lots of different talk about this, and I'm going to propose one example for you. And I'd like for you to think of this as a staircase. So at the top of the staircase is your dream goal. What is possible for you if, for the next two to five years, you worked on your goals diligently and you focused? Now take a step down. In a year from now, what would a long-term goal look like for you? What's possible if you worked diligently and focused? Take another step down. What's possible for you six months from now if, again, you work towards completing your goals? So we think of this as a staircase, with the furthest one being the dream goal, the top one being a dream goal. Okay? Now, these, are, these timelines are adjustable. You need to figure out what works for you. We've forgotten an important piece, though, and this is the piece that gets overlooked most often, the daily goals, the things that we're going to do day in and day out to help us achieve our goals. Because today matters. Today helps us meet our short-term goal, which then helps us meet our long-term goal, which then helps us meet our dream goal. Ken Revisa, a sports psychology consultant at Fullerton, CSU Fullerton, who's a very prominent applied sports psychologist, talks a lot about today and the importance of it. And he has this quote, which I really love, today plus today plus today equals your career. Let's put it another way. Today plus today plus today equals your college degree. Whatever your goal is, you can insert it there. You need to work towards it. But how do we do that? Well, we like acronyms in sports psychology, so I'm going to propose another one to you, which is the SMART principle. The SMART principle helps us to set effective goals. So we want our goals to be specific, measurable, achievable. You'll also see attainable or action-oriented. I personally like adjustable, and I'll get to that in a minute. Realistic is important, and they need to be timely or time-based. So what does that look like? Well, here are some examples. The first example, you can see there's a week time frame. And the three times a week puts that in perspective for us, and we can see that that goal is very specific. The second example is more of a daily example. Okay? And again, this is where people tend to fall down. They don't follow their daily goals. Now, I said our goals are adjustable. We as a group, myself included, have no problem adjusting our goals up. If we were to run for 30 minutes and it felt easy, we would either increase the time that we wanted to run or we'd run faster. And we'd feel very proud about that. But if we couldn't accept that goals were adjustable, we might feel like we failed if we had to adjust our goal down. Let's say you're recovering from the flu, from the flu or you just had foot surgery. And you can't run. You can't do what you need to do. That's OK. Goals are adjustable. As long as we keep that prize in mind of what the short-term, long-term, and dream goals are. So I'm not suggesting don't do anything. I'm just suggesting that we need to be flexible and check in with our goals. Another important point. You want to write your goals down. Some people don't like writing their goals down. But it's a very important step. Because when you do that, they become real. And it, you are accountable to them. I like to say that the goals grow legs, and they become very, very important to you. It helps you to stay focused. Dr. Gail Matthews at the Dominican University of California did a study. She looked at groups of people from five different countries, men and women, people from the 20s all the way up to their 70s. And she had them write down their goals, and she had others just think about their goals. Who do you think actually accomplished their goals? The people that wrote them down, exactly. So write your goals down. It helps you to stay accountable. Now, I said to you earlier, it's never too late to start setting goals and working towards them. On that note, let me introduce you to Mr. Fauja Singh. Mr. Singh was from India and moved to England in his late 80s. Didn't speak English, 
to pass the time, he watched some TV, and he saw this event where these people were running, and they crossed some line, and when they did that, they, there was a lot of celebratory behavior around them. They got roses and hugs and a lot of media attention. And he said, I'd like some of that. What is that about? And his son told him, oh, they just ran a marathon. I'm going to do it, he said. He had 10 weeks to train. His long-term goal, again, adjustable, right? 10 weeks to run the marathon. So he got a coach, and he set daily goals, and he increased his mileage. He finished the marathon in a time of 6 hours and 54 minutes. You'll see 6 hours and 41 minutes, but I truly believe it's 6 hours and 54 minutes. And here's the most important point. He was 89 years old. Is that cool or what? So he recently retired from marathoning just before his 102nd birthday. You're never too old to set goals and start working towards them. So what are the take-home messages about goal setting? You want to think about what you want to achieve and develop a plan. Use the SMART goal principle to help you set effective goals. Record your goals. And remember that it's never too late to start. No mistakes. Hopefully you can see this clearly. In case you're having any trouble, let me just go through it briefly. So this little girl is getting a glass of milk. As she's putting the milk jug away, she bumps her glass and makes a big mess. Her mom comes in and berates her and says, this is terrible, you need to do better, la, la, la. While berating her daughter, she dumps her own coffee cup, big mess. Her son says, it's OK, mom. We all make mistakes. Maybe you've had experience like this yourself. We tend to fear mistakes. The problem with that is we get so negative about that, we focus on it so much, pretty soon one mistake becomes two. And now we have two mistakes to worry about and dwell on, and then soon enough, we have three. And it's this downward spiral from which it's hard to get up. A, pri uh, excuse me, a prime example of this was the Super Bowl. Anybody remember that game? 48 to 3. Opening snap went over Peyton Manning's head, and the Broncos never seemed to recover. A lot of mistakes happening there, and I think there were some athletes dwelling on some of those things. So the football game is kind of a public event. Here's another example of a mistake that somebody might have to deal with for quite some time. I'm pretty certain that when he went in, he wanted that to, to say, tattoo to say, no more mistakes. What he left with, no mod mistakes. Not sure that was the message he was going for. So another public example. OK, so a football game, a tattoo, yes, they're important, but we're not talking life and death, right? On that note, let me introduce you to Dr. Ben Carson. Dr. Carson came from Detroit, Michigan, was raised in a single parent family. His mother was illiterate, but she understood the value of reading and pushed her sons to read. Dr. Carson became a pediatric neurosurgeon. Before his 35th birthday, he led a team to separate conjoined twins from Germany. The twins were seven months old. Surgery lasted 22 hours. After it was done, it was deemed a success. The boys were separated. They survived. Unfortunately, there was a bit of brain damage. So a success, but maybe not a total success. He learned from that. A few years later, there was another set of twins from South Africa. Their situation was a little bit more complicated because of the way they were joined. After a very lengthy surgery, that operation was not successful. Both of the twins died, and Dr. Carson was devastated. He knew, though, that there were lessons to be learned, and that he needed to apply those lessons and think about it for the future. In 1997, there was another set of twins from Zambia. Their surgery was very complicated because they were joined at the top of the head. After 28 hours of surgery, the twins were separated, they survived, and no brain damage. Very much a success. Now, that was only possible because of what had happened in the previous surgery and the lessons that had been learned. Dr. Carol Dweck from Stanford, a psychologist, she would say that Dr. Carson has a growth mindset. Some of you, some of us, 
have something called a fixed mindset. And let me share with you what that looks like. Maybe you've been in this situation at some point. You got a quiz back and, you know, not the grade you were expecting. It's not a terrible grade, but it's not a great grade. Well, if you respond to this by saying, I'm a total failure, there's no way I'm going to pass this class. There were trick questions on that test, okay? Then you have a fixed mindset. You're not looking to learn from your mistakes. You're not looking at this as a learning opportunity, okay? If, however, you respond with, wow, okay, that was a wake-up call. I need to work harder in this class if I want to pass. I need to check in with the professor. I need to figure out what I need to do better. If you take that approach, you have a growth mindset. And that's the kind of mindset you really want to have. You want to be resilient. So what are the take-home messages? We want to reframe our mistakes, pull out the lessons. Remember that a mistake is only a mistake if you fail to pull out the lesson and apply it in the future. Try to have a growth mindset. That's a good mindset to have. Let's talk about imagery. Imagery is the ability to recreate or create an experience in the mind. There are two perspectives that we talk about when we refer to imagery. The first is an external perspective or a third world view. So athletes image themselves like they see themselves on TV. There's also an internal perspective. And this is known as a first person perspective. So, for example, if a soccer player was imaging himself from a first-person perspective, he would look down and he would see his foot contact the ball. He wouldn't be able to see his back or his head or anything like that because he can't see that from behind his own eyes. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, that's great. I don't do sports anymore. How can I use imagery? Well, maybe this example will resonate with you. This is my kitchen after a family dinner. I'm not a big fan of washing dishes. I have a dishwasher. That's what it's supposed to do. So, before I pack the dishwasher, I look down the counter, and I see what I have to put in there. I look at my dishwasher, and I get a pretty good image of how I'm gonna pack it. I refer to myself as the master packer, because I get a ton of stuff in there, and I rarely have to repack. Everything is exactly as it should be in there. I see it before it goes in, and I don't waste a lot of time. Parallel parking is another great example of how I use imagery. Maybe you do also. But imagery is really a polysensory experience. You'll hear people say visualization. And the problem with visualization is that people only tend to think of sight. But imagery is really polysensory or multisensory. And I'm going to share with you an example of what that might be like. So here's a baseball player, and let's say he was imaging himself making a catch. So he might hear the sound of the bat, you know, that crack. He might see the ball coming towards him. He might experience the glove and how it touches his hand and the ball coming into the glove. He might feel happy about making the catch or feel confident in his ability to make the catch. He might smell the grass, and he might even taste the sweat that could be on his upper lip. So you can see how all of the senses come together. This is important, because the more real we make imagery, the more we trick the brain to believing that we actually just did that thing. The brain doesn't know the difference. Okay? And that's important when we're trying to save wear and tear on the body or there's only an opportunity to do something one time. I'd like to share with you another example of how imagery can be effective. This is Joe Ng. He's a Canadian table tennis player, made the national team at the age of 15, the youngest player to ever do that. Just before his 23rd birthday, he felt a, like a muscle pull in his chest area, went to go and get it checked out. Turns out it was actually cancer. He was pretty devastated by that. The doctors told him, you have two months, and you have about a 2% chance of recovery. He said, OK, well, I'm an elite athlete. I've got the sports psychology background. I'm going to use that to help me get better. And that sounds weird, I know. But he would visualize or image himself 
feeling strong. He would try to relax more. Something else he did was something we refer to as healing imagery. So when he was getting his chemotherapy, he imagined that the chemotherapy was like Pac-Man. Remember that game from the 80s and 90s? So he imagined that the chemotherapy was Pac-Man. And the cancer cells were the pellets. So as the chemotherapy entered and ran through his body, it ate up all the cancer cells. While he was in treatment, he went off and did a, an event, like a world championship or something like that. He didn't do great. I mean, I guess that's to be expected. He was going through chemo, and I can't even imagine how devastating that is to your body, but he did okay. When he came back, he continued with his treatment. He was going to do another round or another course. Went in to see the doctor, and the doctor said, there's no point. We don't need to do this. Okay. The reason is there was no more cancer in his body. Completely gone. Now, you might think I'm making this up. I swear to you this is a true story. Somehow, between the chemotherapy that he did, the healing imagery, and all the other skills that he used, cancer was gone from his body. Okay? So healing imagery can be really important to healing and recovery. It also lets athletes feel like they have some control over the injury or the illness, and that can be very important too. Using the senses to create an experience in the mind. We haven't talked much about that. So I'd like to share with you an example. Meet Nick Walenda. You may remember back in the summer of 2012, he was the very first person to enter Canada from the United States via a tightrope over Niagara Falls. So he had one opportunity to physically do this. I've never met Nick Walenda, but I'm 100% certain that he probably created an image of him doing this event and ran that image hundreds, maybe thousands of times in preparation of actually doing that event. And this is what it looks like. Now, some of you might be saying, yeah, but he was tethered. You know, he did that thing, but if he fell, he was going to be fine. He was going to still make it. Well, let me go back a second. You see the picture on the right? That's him crossing the Grand Canyon last summer, completely untethered. Again, I would argue that he did not do this for the first time in June 2013. But instead, he imaged and did that imagery hundreds, probably thousands of times in preparation. So what are the take-home messages regarding imagery? Use external and internal views but try to be as inclusive of all the senses as possible. Use it in your daily chores, sport tasks, and even to help you with things like healing. Let's move on to focus. Focusing is the ability to attend to relevant stimuli while ignoring inappropriate or irrelevant stimuli. Here we have some distracted drivers. One on a handheld device talking, the other one looks like she's texting. Clearly, these drivers are not attending to the appropriate stimuli. And we can even see that the passenger is pointing out, hey, there's something there, you better pay attention. Okay, so not attending to what they're supposed to. Here's another example that you may see sometimes. This is a college class, not at Fresno State, of course. But we have the professor lecturing at the front of the class. And we have a couple of students who seem to be following along at the back. They have the same thing on their screen as the professor. However, we also see people checking Facebook, checking their email, getting on Twitter, Googling stuff. Clearly, these students are not attending to what they're supposed to be, which is the professor giving the lecture. There's good news, though. What you choose to focus on is totally within your control. You direct your focus, and your focus leads your performance. And this is from Terry Orlick, a very prominent sports psychology consultant from Canada. So you choose whether or not you are going to let yourself be distracted. There are a lot of distractions out there. Let's talk about that. Perhaps you're an or a musician in an orchestra. External distractions for you might be other musicians around you. It might be the conductor and that person's style. 
It might be the fact that you're sitting underneath an air conditioning vent and you're getting cold air blown on you. It could be the fact that you're on stage and there's a whole bunch of eyes looking at you. There are also internal distractions. A racing heart that we can't seem to control. Achy muscles or sore joints. And probably one of the most prominent right here. Self-doubt, negative self-talk. Distractions can really wreak havoc with performance. Shawnee Davis, speed skater, shut out of this year's Olympics, but won quite a bit of hardware in the previous ones. And he said, the, just, the distractions took a toll on me. The energy was really bad. Now, you may remember there were some things related to the bodysuits that they were wearing. There were some contentious issues within the speed skating organization. There were probably things going on internally, too, that we're not aware of. The fact of the matter is, he did not achieve peak performance. Somebody who did achieve peak performance, though, is Hammerin' Hank. Hank Aaron played for the Atlanta Braves back in the day, and you may remember that he was chasing Babe Ruth for the distinction of being at the top of the home run hitting board. A lot of people did not like that. They felt like an African American should not replace a white person at the top of that list. So he had a lot of negative distractions to deal with. Crowd noise, booing, a lot of negative media attention, maybe some internal things as well. But he found a way to narrow his focus. I'm going to blow up this hat a little bit to illustrate my point. I'm not sure if you can see those little eye holes on the hat. When he was on the batting team, he would take his hat off and he would put it in front of his face. And he would look through that little eye hole at the pitcher. And he would study the pitcher. And from that, he was able to figure out what pitch was going to come towards him. Because he would recognize that certain pitches came a certain way from the pitcher. And when they left that pitcher's hand, he knew it was going to be a curveball or a slider or whatever. Okay, So he found a way to really narrow his focus so he could be successful. Some people might say, well, you know what? He was in this thing called the zone. You've heard of the zone, right? The zone is this state where it's euphoria. Everything's going great. You're not thinking because you don't have to. It's effortless. Time passes. It's a wonderful place to be. Unfortunately, it doesn't usually last for very long. The best performers, even the very best, are going to get distracted. But They've learned how to compensate and adjust, compensate and adjust. And I'm borrowing that from Ken Revisa as well. They figured out how to get themselves back to focus when, not if, but when they get distracted. And I'd like to share with you kind of a case study that I've done on my own about a performer that I think is really good at being able to focus. This performer is a senior in college, and he's married. And him and his wife just had their first baby. He plays a sport. And guess what? It's a high profile sport. And he's in a key position. He's expected to lead his team to a, a league championship and maybe even something beyond that. There's a little piece of the puzzle that I didn't tell you. That baby that was just born is very sick. If you haven't figured out who I'm talking about yet, it's Derek Carr. Derek Carr faced tremendous pressure last fall and probably is right now as he gets ready for the NFL draft. But what I've learned about him is I think he's somebody who really is able to focus and focus through distractions. And I think he did this by using a number of different strategies, and some of which I'm going to touch on. He compartmentalized, I think. When he was doing football, he wasn't thinking about his wife and his newborn son. Think about how hard that must have been. But he stayed focused on football. And when he was with his child and his wife, he probably wasn't thinking much about football. So he's choosing to be present. He's choosing to be where he is. And that helped him, I think, to perform well. Now, I told you performers will get distracted, and I'm sure that happened with him as well. I think probably he used cue words or cue images to help him bring his focus back. For example, he might have looked down and saw the bulldog on his chest and realized, you know what, it's football time right now. Right now, I need to be thinking about football. Or he might have brought himself back to focus by saying something like, be here, be now. 
Okay? Those are just some examples. I don't know. I haven't consulted with him, and even if I could, I couldn't tell you about it, because there's something called athlete confidentiality. But I think this is what's going on, given my interactions with other people who talk to him a lot. So what are the take-home messages? Be present. Plan for distractions. If you know that you get distracted by other people, sit at the front of the class. Sit at the front of the class, and then you won't be distracted by all the things going on in front of you, because the only thing in front of you is the professor. Okay? Use strategies like compartmentalizing, being present. Use keywords when you get distracted. Let's talk about O. Positive self-talk. I'd like to say that we do a lot of this, but in fact, the opposite is true. We spend a lot of time engaging in negative self-talk. Not everybody, but a lot of us. We say things like, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I can't do it, I'm stupid. Really silly things to be saying to ourselves. If we had a friend that talked to us like that, that friend probably wouldn't be a friend for very long. Because we wouldn't allow that person to talk to us that way. But yet, we talk to ourselves and it's okay. Well, it's not really okay. So I have an activity that I'm going to share with you to help you be intentional about changing your negative self-talk to positive. I want you to get a bunch of cue cards or index cards. And I want you to think about the negative self-talk that you use. If you say to yourself, I can't exercise, I'm just, I'm not good at it, then write down, I can exercise for 30 minutes. If you say, you know what, I'm not a good writer, I, I, I just, I, I can't organize my thoughts, I'm just not good at it, write down, I can write a good term paper. And if you say, okay, public speaking totally freaks me out, can't do it, write down, I'm good at public speaking. So figure out what are the negative things you say to yourself and counter it with something positive. Write them down. Then take these cue cards, post them up in high traffic areas, maybe on your refrigerator door, your bathroom mirror, beside your computer monitor, wherever. Each time you see these statements, stop. Think about what's there. Say that out loud and with a strong voice to yourself. I know that sounds corny, but trust me, do it. It's really cool, it works, right? Once you start to say these things over and over to yourself, they'll start to replace the negative self-talk. And that's what we want. Now some people say to me, well, but that's a lie. I'm a terrible public speaker. I can't write a term paper and I certainly can't exercise for 30 minutes. Well, these things are not lies. It's what you're working towards. They're self-directions, not self-deceptions. Muhammad Ali, everybody remember him? He told everybody and anybody who would listen that he was the greatest before he ever was. And that's what you need to do. Talk to yourself in positive ways. Replace the negative with positive. Something else I want you to consider. How you think is your choice. Now, that's a hard one to wrap ourselves around. How we think is our choice. It's true. And good thoughts lead to good feelings, lead to good behaviors. So we want to have good thoughts. If you're having trouble with that, though, the reverse is always true as well. Good behaviors lead to good feelings, lead to good thoughts. And this is a phenomenon that we call fake it until you make it. So the little pussy cat looks in the mirror, sees the big lion, okay? Now he's got the confidence to take on the world. Body language is an important component of that. If we walk around with our head held high, our shoulders back, we're going to feel confident about ourselves and we're going to think confident things. Okay? So body language is also very important. Okay? Now, none of these things are going to happen overnight. I once had an athlete say to me, I tried that healing imagery once, it didn't work. Yeah, that sounds about right. You need to practice in order to get better. Okay, with time, I guarantee you, it'll work and get better for you. I'd like to share with you a quick story about somebody who exudes positivity, who exudes resilience and optimism. And this is J.R. Martinez. You might not know his whole backstory, so really quick, he was deployed to Iraq. Within a month of being there, the Humvee that he was driving hit a roadside bomb. The three soldiers who were with him were ejected, but he got trapped. 
and he suffered burns to a significant part of his body, and you can see them on his head and his face. For the next 34 months, almost three years, he was in the hospital dealing with this. He's gone through more than 30 surgeries. And while I don't think he wanted to experience the pain again, I'm told that that's excruciating and significant, he said he wouldn't change his accident because this has given him an opportunity to serve others, to be positive with others and make a difference in their lives with burn victims and disabled veterans. He's somebody who just exudes this positive element. He won Dancing with the Stars. I don't know a whole lot about reality TV, but I do know that America votes. And I've been told that they don't always vote for the person who is the best dancer. Having said that, I'm sure he garnered a lot of votes because he's such a positive person. People like that, and they want to see that be rewarded. So, what are the take-home messages? Talk to yourself in positive ways. Treat yourself like you would a friend. Most of us would never tell a friend, you dumb, you can't do that. So don't say that to yourself. Choose to dwell on the positive, how we think is our choice. Remember, good thoughts lead to good feelings, lead to good behaviors, but the reverse is also true. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about R. R in uniform is relaxation and stress control, but really what we're talking about is regulating arousal level. Now, I told you I work in the high schools, or we do some stuff in the high schools, and I'm very, very worried about using the term, we're going to regulate your arousal level with high school students. So we just go with relaxation and stress control, OK? Now, we have two extremes, mentally flat. Now, maybe some of you have experienced this. It's like, oh, I don't want to do this. I just, I'm not into it. I'm not there. I'd rather do anything but this. That's mentally flat. And it's true that this athlete may just be taking a break. But I look at that, and I see mentally flat. Overstimulated is the other end of the extreme. And we've seen these athletes, right? Wow, are they hyped up. So those are the two ends of the spectrum. Everybody has to find his or her own sweet spot that comes somewhere in between. We call that the individualized zone of optimal functioning. And it's different for every person. Some people need more activation. Some people need less. Each person is different. Steve Cawthon, back in the 70s, I know that was a while ago, but I've included this for two reasons. One, I'm trying to have a lot of sports represented to try to catch everyone's interest. But two, I love this quote. So he was Sports Illustrated, Sportsman of the Year, and he said, I don't psych myself up. I psych myself down. I think clearer when I'm not psyched up. So he's a jockey, probably weighs about 115 pounds. He's on a 1,000-plus pound animal traveling at a super fast speed with not a lot of room to maneuver. So that makes sense. But some other people might need more activation. Okay, everyone is different. I'd like to think about stress and give you another example so we can think about it in another way. Dr. Richard Lazarus, excuse me, from Berkeley, he's deceased now, but he's done a lot of work in stress. And he says that stress occurs when the perceived or actual demands of a situation meet or exceed the actual or, avail or, excuse me, actual or perceived resources available to meet that demand. So let me share with you an example that may make sense. So midterms. Midterms coming up? Yeah? So if you don't have any resources available, maybe you've been on Facebook during class or you haven't brought the textbook, haven't bought the textbook yet, or you haven't been taking notes, or you haven't studied, then you are probably going to be really stressed out about that exam. On the other hand, if you've been in class, you have the textbook, you've been studying, you have been keeping up with everything, then you see this exam as a challenge. I got this. I can do it. So two different ways to approach it. Here's another example. Ask yourself this. Do I have control of the situation? If the answer is yes, then there's really no need to get stressed about something, because you can control it. Right? Act on it. You can do something about it. There's no need to be stressed. Let's say that there's a situation, though, that you have no control over. 
Maybe you're sitting in traffic. Maybe your flight got delayed again. You can't control those things. So, should you get stressed about it? No. You don't have any control over it. Your stress is wasted energy. There's no point. So, what do we do with this? Well, there are going to be times when you're sitting in traffic or your flight gets delayed and you're still stressed. So what can we do? Travis Stork, ER physician. However, those of you who like reality TV may remember him from The Bachelor. He's also the host of the show The Doctors. But he's still an ER physician. And he says what he does is he breathes. He takes a moment, he focuses on his breathing, that helps to center him, and then he can think. Another strategy that you can use is to, again, use those keywords. With practice, you can say things like relax or chill or whatever it is that works for you to just bring your heart rate down and center yourself. You might scan your body for tension. A lot of us carry tension in our neck and our upper backs. So just, you know, relax your shoulders. Just relax that area. You can also do progressive excuse me, progressive muscular relaxation. Another example is to change the channel. If you're on a stress channel in your head, take a remote, click it, and change the channel to something else. Go to a happy channel. Go to a channel where you're lying on the beach. You can go anywhere you want. It's your brain and your remote control. But use that to help you not be so stressed in that moment. So, take home messages. R is really about regulating arousal levels. Find your sweet spot or your eyes off, individualized zone of optimal functioning. Practice your strategies in low stress situations so they become a habit. Ask yourself this question Do I really need to get stressed about this? If we're really honest with ourselves, most of the time the answer to that is no. Let's talk about make routines. Routines are really important. They're a pattern of behaviors that we do to help keep us on track. For example, you probably have a shower routine. You get in the shower, you do things in a certain order. Well, surgeons also have routines. And there was a study by St. Johns Hopkins University researchers that looked at something called never events. Never events are mistakes that happen in the hospitals that are 100% completely avoidable. 39 incidences of never events are reported every week in US hospitals. Now, if surgeons and the nurses and all the people surrounding these situations use checklists, use routines, these never events, such as operating on the wrong foot or leaving gauze or sponges or towels inside of patients, those things won't happen if they follow routines. Routines are important. Of course, we're not just talking about pattern of behaviors. We're also going to be talking about thoughts and feelings. And I'd like to introduce to you one of my favorite NBA players, who's Steve Nash. Steve Nash played for the Phoenix Suns, now plays for the Lakers. And he is known as being a very effective free throw shooter. His percentage is about 90%. When he gets to the line, he goes through a whole routine. He does this thing with his fingers and his mouth, kind of gross actually. Then he takes two, you know, practice air shots, doesn't have the ball. I think at that time he's imaging the ball going through the net. He's probably talking to himself in positive and confident ways. And as I said, when he gets to the line, 90% of the time, he scores points for his team. The really neat thing about routines is that when you are consistent with them, when you use them all the time, it becomes about the task that you're doing and not the meaning of the task. And let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. In the Western Conference Championships in 2010 against the San Antonio Spurs, Steve Nash was elbowed and although it may be hard to see, he's basically playing with his eye almost completely swollen shut. He played a great game. He went to the line. He went through his routine, boom, one point, one point, one point. Continued to shoot threes, the whole thing. Why? 
because he had a routine. He could fall back on that routine, even though his eye was almost completely swollen shut. So having routines takes the meaning of the event away. And by the way, as I said, that was the Western Conference Championship, right? He could have said, ah, it's the Western Conference Championship. My eye, I can't play. Just followed his routines. Athletes will say, ah, it's the Olympics. Or students will say, ah, it's the final exam. Doesn't matter. Why? The job is the same. If you're a bobsled athlete, your job is to get down that course as quickly as you can. Doesn't matter if it's a practice run, if it's the trials, or if it's the Olympic finals. Your job is the same. And when you approach your job with a routine, and that routine is consistent, the meaning goes away, and that helps you to experience success. I want to say something else about routines. Superstitions have a way of making themselves into routines. Serena Williams, when she starts the US Open or Wimbledon, she doesn't change her socks. Those must be some pretty stinky socks. Tiger Woods, red shirt Sundays. Okay. Wade Boggs, now in the Hall of Fame for Major League Baseball. Early in his career, he had a game where he had multiple hits. And guess what? He ate chicken before that game. So from that point on, he had to have chicken before every game that he played. And of course, there's something called the playoff beard. Sidney Crosby from the Pittsburgh Penguins trying to sport a playoff beard. Once playoff starts in hockey and in other sports, the athletes don't shave. Okay? Now these things are superstitions. Whether or not an athlete shaves has nothing to do with how that athlete's going to perform. You cannot tell me that Serena Williams won Wimbledon because she didn't change her socks. She won because she's a superior athlete who mentally and physically prepared for that. So you don't need to sit in a certain seat when you take an exam or chew gum or whatever it is. None of that matters. You'll do well on that exam if you've mentally prepared for it and you're able to focus in that moment. Superstitions have a way of taking control away from the athlete. We want the athlete to be in control. Key points. Include the physical and the mental components. Remember that routines are not just about behaviors. They're also about thoughts and feelings. When you follow routines consistently, you will eliminate the meaning of that event because the job is the same. And again, avoid superstitions. You want to have the control. Don't give it away to socks or chicken or anything else. So uniform. Seven sports psychology skills or concepts, again, based on best practices, my consulting experience and my research. Not mutually exclusive boxes, lots of interlap, lots of overplay, lots of marriage. If you work on these skills, you can achieve peak performance. Without a doubt in my mind, 100% of the time, I know that that is true. Here are some final take home messages. Uniform sports psychology, it's for everyone. Elite athletes, novice performers, young, old, doesn't matter. It's for everyone. Start working on these things now. If you work on them in what we call a low stress environment and you make them a habit, when you get into that intense situation, that tool is ready in your toolbox and you'll be able to use it. Don't wait for a problem. Guess when I get phone calls? I have an event coming up. Can you help me? I need some sports psychology. Okay. Be proactive. Work on them regularly. Okay? So I'm going to leave you with a final question. This is a question that I ask myself. I ask the graduate students and the athletes with whom I work. Do you have your uniform on? Are you mentally prepared for what it is that you're going to do? I hope that if it hasn't been before, the answer will now be yes. Thank you very much.